Good morning, good day, and good evening. I'm as always your host, Brody Robertson, and today, <clears throat> my voice is dying apparently. We're not restarting that. I, uh, we have a KDE person on today, David Evanson. Welcome to the show. How you doing? Hello. I'm doing fine, thank you very much. And luckily for I've got once... My, I've got, I, I've, sorry? I've been looking at all your, thumb, I've been looking at all your thumbnails, mm -hmm. got a, a suitable shirt on. Now I just need to do irrelevant faces. See, the thing is, people don't realise how their face moves sometimes. Like, I, none of those, like, thumbnail pictures I've forced. They've just been, I found weird frames throughout the video, and they just happen to work pretty well. Like, the ones I do for my, like, actual main channel stuff, like, those are planned. But anything on this channel, entirely just off the cuff. Whatever happens, I just scrub through the video, I find something like, hmm, I think that works. <laughs> Go with that. What I was going to say before is uh, my internet's actually working stably today, which is a nice change. So hopefully everything actually works. There's no thunderstorm today, which is good. Um, so let's just see how that goes, and hopefully nothing changes there. <laughs> but if you freeze, it just means I've bored you to death rather than an internet problem. <laughs> yeah, well, look, let's make sure that doesn't happen. Um... <laughs> People may not know your name, but they may know some of the stuff that you've been involved with. So, we... Do you want to get started on that, or do you want to start instead on, like, how you got involved in, like, KD and stuff first? That probably makes more sense to start with, yeah. Then we can go into, like, the actual stuff you've done on in the project. KD. I mean, I've been in KD for 15 years. I'm very... In my mind, long-time contributor, but it's mm. people who go generations before me. And the backstory is the same as everyone. I was mm. meant to be studying. I did not do that. Instead, started hacking away at a project. And I did not finish my PhD because I got a job. And that's a way forwards. <laughs> well, hey, and, you could have said I didn't finish my PhD and I didn't have a job. So, you know, there's a silver lining there. Exactly. So, not worth finishing it. Don't take me for academic advice on this. But yeah, I mean, same story with everyone. You go for, you get introduced to Linux, mm -hmm. you have that weird Gen 2 phase, and okay. then you get out of it. <laughs> and um, yeah, a point where you think, ah, oh, I'm so much faster with a terminal for everything, <laughs> because you're faster with a terminal for some things, and then you start browsing your web in some console UI, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. slowly that starts going away. I found myself from one of these minimalistic window managers where you just have a tiny box in your terminals to, oh, I'll start running Kmail. Oh, I'll start running Capetta, a messaging mm -hmm. client. And then before I knew it, I was running Kicker, the main KDE panel. I was like, I should just be start using KDE at this point. And, and then somehow went to my first conference, mm -hmm. started doing more and more patches. Became the maintainer of more and more things, too many things. Now I'm the maintainer of Quinn, partly with some other amazing people. Cute Wayland, mm -hmm. the entire Wayland backend for all of the Cute clients, as well as generally Plasma stuff. You've got a lot on your plate, it sounds like. Pardon? I said, you've got a lot on your plate, it sounds like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not enough time. Not I can still spare some time for interviews with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. So, you said you started on KDE back in 2008. How long had you been using Linux before that point, by then? I know where dates are confusing. You have to work yeah, out how yeah. old would I be back then. Yeah. So, I mean... Not Rough many years. Yeah. I mean, start on, back in the day, everyone started on Mandrake or this live CD called Nopix. Those I was going to say the other one is into... Red Hat Linux, which I've, I've had a lot oh, of people maybe. say Red Hat Linux. Back, back when you get a CD, you, you, your way to get Linux would be mm -hmm. to go to a shop mm -hmm. and buy a magazine with a CD on your front because installing 700 megabytes would just be an outrageous amount of phone time and you get shouted at a lot by your mother. Mm -hmm. So that's how you, got, how you got Linux back then. 
So he started on Mandrake, mm -hmm. but then university with a big internet connection to your world, it was amazing. And then you somehow expanded out, you got to Gen 2 at some point. Oh, I mean, that's a you go through your phases when you when, when you start vicing, start customizing everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, mean, I joined this computer society group at university, and they had the people who were hardcore into Linux as a technology. Mm -hmm. And then, equally, I just one friend who was into open source, not into necessarily Linux as for your tech, but open into open source as a philosophy. Right, right. And that guy it was fascinating. Because he was blind, legally blind. He could see a little bit, but mm -hmm. blind. And a, back then, a lot of accessibility tech was rubbish in the commercial world. Mm -hmm. And open source, also rubbish, but you could fix it. Right, right. So, I mean, he, he had this monitor where you had X11 and you panned around when you moved your mouse to the edge of the screen because his font took up like quarter of the screen each. And... He was amazing, because mm. one of the first pro things he started telling me about was back in and DVDs were how you watched media. Mm -hmm. And there was a DMCA at the time, a Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And it was illegal to make it so you can uh, avoid strobe effects on a DVD and prevent people from having epileptic shocks, because that's manipulating a media. So he was very passionate about all this accessibility things and right. making things safe was technically illegal and circumventing the law. So a whole open source thing of, or let's just change things because we can change things mm -hmm. was something he was passionate about. To a point that he has this cool project um, called A Grip, okay. which was a version of Quake for blind people. Okay. A grip.org, I think you'll find it if you want to bring it up because yeah, I'll see it. it sounds insane. It is insane. I've played it. Got nowhere. I got shot all the time by blind people. Your walls make sound, aliens make sound, and then you navigate around. How do you spell a grip? Because there's also a government agency with a, a G R I P. There's a government agency with the exact same name. Ah, oh, here we go. No, I found it. Okay, yeah. It's a grip.org.uk. Uh, .org Grip.org oh, course, is the government yeah. agency. Yeah, okay. Okay, this is... Huh. And it was still being updated, and... like, as of two years ago. Oh, wow. And Quake was open source back then, and this was the idea of you take code and you make something else out of it, completely <laughs> different to what the authors intended, but still amazing for some other people. Mm-hmm really made an impact. I mean, I'm talking about this 15 years later because it's still in my head. And that combination of using, being introduced to Linux by people who were just vicing their systems and having cool themes, and this guy who was passionate about open source, and mm -hmm. that sort of made me start developing on the things that interested me, which, you know, wasn't quite for blind people. But... Um, yeah, then just started hacking more and more and more, and then before you know it, you end up here. Eventually, uh, you know, running parts of the KD project. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, that the thing you mentioned about, you know, starting with these terminal applications, then slowly bringing these GUI tools, because you realize, like, the GUI tools actually are just a more efficient way to do it. Like, that reminds me of how I used to do things with, like, my emails and calendar and all that. Like, I would have, I'd have, like, CalCurse and all these tools. Now I just use Thunderbird. It's fine. It's great. It does everything I need. <laughs> yeah, it's about using your right tool for your job mm -hmm. and not saying, I'm sometimes fast in terminal, FI, always, because... Yeah, yeah. It's not yeah. always true. Yeah, don't get me wrong. I still use a lot of, like, mm -hmm. like my main file manager is, like, a terminal file manager because I've got a thousand hotkeys that go to exactly where I need stuff to go. Like, that is a really convenient way for me to work, but there are times when just using a, like, using a GUI is just more convenient for things like, I don't know, I want to drag a file into Discord, for example, or I want to, like, you know, like, one thing, I, I upload a YouTube video, 
I can just have the file manager open, drag the file into the web browser, and it just uploads it. Like, that stuff that, like, yeah, there's, like, weird workarounds that you can do stuff with terminal applications, but it's absolutely a workaround, and half the time you end up just opening a GUI anyway. It's, like, a very minimal GUI that just exists for the sole purpose of dragging a file, which, at that point, you might as well just use a file manager properly. Absolutely. <laughs> But now I'm going to sell you on my favorite feature in KDE's file manager, Dolphin. Okay. You, you press a button, little mm -hmm. terminal pops up out at the bottom. Right, right. That's sure. not that, that insane. No, it's pretty But normal. when you change directory in the terminal, mm -hmm. the UI on top changes to the same folder. Right. And if you change folder in your UI, the terminal changes directory to the same folder. So ah, okay. you can have a UI, start clicking through, clicking on your bookmarks or whatever, and then if you need to type grep, pipe, whatever, you know, something that's not necessarily trivial to do in a UI. Mm -hmm. You do that, you're in your life folder, it's magic. That's actually really cool. Because it's pretty common it's to have, like, a hotkey. my favorite feature. Yeah, it's pretty common to have a hotkey to, like, open up a terminal in the current directory you're in, but actually having them directly linked like that, I, I don't know of another, there's probably another file manager that does it, but I don't know of one myself. I mean, it's my go-to feature of sort of... And KD had this motto for a while of simple by default, powerful when needed, which is a cool phrase, I think. Um, and I think it sort of encapsulates what we're trying to get at mm -hmm. with the UI of don't shove a terminal when you use the face for no reason, because <laughs> that's not a good UI. Mm -hmm. And you want to dumb things, you, want, you don't want to dumb things down, but you want to make it so it's easy to find the common things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But having all this stuff just slightly blow your hood so you can do this if you want to get that sort of thing because linux users are mostly nerds sure it is a target or it is the audience you're you're making stuff for it's mm -hmm. making stuff for ourselves you get better things when you make things for yourself mm -hmm. you know that that does make sense like having a providing those powerful tools but sort of having a layer on top of it that's very approachable for someone who might be new to that sort of experience. Like, you know, you've moved over from Windows, you moved over from Mac OS, you're familiar with this normal file manager approach of doing stuff. But if you want that extra level of control in those cases where maybe, you know, I, I, does the KD file manager have like a mass renaming uh, function? There is one as a standalone application. I was yeah, going to say, because that's like... We do have a something. That's a basic thing you could ha like do in the terminal. That's really easy to do. But then doing that from the GUI tool, if there's no function for that, like... Maybe you don't need that, like, every day. Maybe it doesn't make sense to have it as a GUI tool. But having a quick way to just get the terminal open and do that there, like, that's really nice to have. Yeah. Definitely. I think... Dolphin... Dolphin's the name of our file manager. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, comes, comes from users using it. And it, as someone shows in, in the project is the person developing it uses it. And mm -hmm. you don't always have that. I think certainly a lot of commercial projects lack that. It's people mm -hmm. guessing what users want. And that's not always in sync. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Well, there's still a lot of that in, in the fossil world. It's, it's hard to... It's hard to understand what the the users as a general collective want and what the loud people who feel like getting involved in the issue tracker want. Because those aren't definitely. always the same group. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I spend up a lot of my diet on my bugzilla, uh, and you see the same names again and again and yeah. again. And if that is a target audience, my only audience, then mm -hmm. I should just give up what I'm doing because <laughs> a very, it's just a handful of people. Mm -hmm. You're right. There's definitely a huge passive voice. But most people aren't too dissimilar. Mm -hmm. It might not be the same nerd as us. I mean, we don't need tools. To, I mean, development tools of their own software. But... Mm -hmm. They're still Linux users. <laughs> I think what's important is to get something out there and then sort of test the waters with what people feel about it. Like, it's 
all well and good to just sit there and theory craft about what people might want. Like, you know, have this big this big group meeting, like, okay, how are we going to do this? But eventually, like, something has to be released. And no matter what you do, yeah. there's going to be some people that don't like the idea. Like, for example, the, the recent thing with swapping from single click to open to double click as the default. Like, there are people... I, don't, I, I will ask you about your opinion on that in a minute, but um, there are people who are like die hard, single click to open. Anything besides that is terrible. Then there are people who are like, no, double click to open is, that's the way that everything else does it. Like, this is like what it should be done. But what you need to do is just get something out there and then see what people actually want. And luckily in the KDE case, oftentimes that also comes with customization as well. Like, in this one, like, you can swap back to the old method if you yeah. wanted to, so it's not like that for everything, obviously, but when there are things that do make sense to have as a configuration option, it is nice to have that there as well for those people. So you asked about my opinion. Yeah. I mean, people who prefer double-click should take her mouse in the garden and bury it. It makes no sense. But... I do understand that if you keep hearing the same remarks again and again and again and again, there must be some basis for it. Mm -hmm. And there is a, almost everything comes down to some levels of compromise mm -hmm. because people are used to it. There's a level of familiarity. If you swap back and forth, I understand familiarity. Keeping that familiarity to go back and forth mm -hmm. is important. We don't want to be making an exact clone or something. Mm -hmm. And that's frustrating when these people start saying, oh, and then you should have this setting for this here because that's the way Windows does it. And yeah, yeah. I think it's fine. I think it's fine that people should can have a learning curve. Sure. We don't have to be the same as long as everything's findable. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the fact that this one keeps coming up again and again and again means these people, despite being wrong, um, yeah, it, it do need to be somehow catered for and as you said, it's only a setting. Mm -hmm. Why do you prefer single click? What What's your reasoning for that? On the web. Uh -huh. Okay, click. this is where we're going, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's where I'm going, because on, on, on the web you single click. Mm -hmm. So, in my daily life, there's nothing I double click on. Mm -hmm. right? And it everything else to invoke an action, button, OK, cancel, mm -hmm. you single click on it. It doesn't matter if it's a destructive action, you, you, you single click on it. So this one, why? I mean, it, if, you, if, you, if you don't have that, a preconception, mm -hmm. double clicking on it seems a questionable thing to do. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand why. It's because you need to separate select and invoke. Mm -hmm. But... It's a somewhat arbitrary thing to do. You don't, nobody double right clicks on anything. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. I mean, it's probably some video game where you do or something, but... Almost certainly. Yeah. Oh, but, but I mean, but... Yeah, there are, okay, but now you mentioned that, it definitely is. Yeah. Huh. Oh, no, I was thinking but of, common... um... Oh, sorry, I was, th I was thinking of um, Armored Core, where you can have a semi-auto uh, gun in your right hand, and you right click to shoot it. So technically, you I, double click, whatever. Yeah. I'm just going to nod along just so I look cool and pretend <laughs> I know these references. It's a mech game. But I, I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, I know what you mean. I mean, if in video games, if you play a one where it's not WASD to move and moving a mouse, you, mm. you'd think it's weird. No matter if you come up with something better. Sure. It, weird is bad, so I, know, I understand that. Mm-hmm. I guess, well, I personally, I just do double click because that, I have no actual reason for it. It's just what I've always done. That's, that's my entire reason yeah. for doing it. I really get used to single click. I just use double click because that's, it's just how far manages what would work for me. But if you, like, if your first computing device was a phone or was like a Chromebook and you did everything on the web, like, that's not an unreasonable situation now. Like, there are going to be people where, they won't like their, their first like you know couple of years of using a computing device is going to be something where every single interaction 
is either going to be a single click or a hold click. Double click is just not an yeah. operation that exists whatsoever. We introduced a hold and click pattern in, mm. in, in Plasma. Uh, it was to enter the edit mode of the dragging applets. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And, yeah. and even though it was a common pattern on the phone, mm. that also wasn't understood because it's a common pattern on the phone. Nobody expects it on your desktop mm. because mm. you've got a mouse. So we introduced that pattern and it, it sort of tanked. Similar reason of it might be fine, but if it's unfamiliar... It, I've probably seen like one or two applications do it for a similar sort of function, but it's definitely not common. Not common enough to be like a standard understood pattern, at least. Yeah, so we've, we've sort of separated. I mean, now we've got a lot of access to what input device did what, mm -hmm. and we start split, having different behaviors based on what users interacting with because. Mm -hmm. As you said, if you're if you're touching with with your big fingers, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, double clicking is kind of weird. You want to press yeah. once and then get some sort of UI prompt or something. Mm -hmm. it, so, yeah, you, you do need to customize based on input because mm -hmm. they're different. That well, yeah, that's definitely true. What is the um the touch support like on KDE? I that's not an area that I've really paid any attention to. We're in a difficult state in KDE as a transition between two technologies. Right. We've got the old widgets, which is writing a C++, here's a push button, blah, blah. and then we have the newer apps coming up, up written in Qt Quick. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, I can't hear you. Your, uh, is that my end? Wait, can you hear me? Raise your hand if you can hear me. What? Wait, what happened? Um, uh, I'm going to drop out of the call for a moment and come back. Sorry, <laughs> I was going to ask a question again. Oh. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, the <clears throat> state of touch support in KDE. Um, yeah, so... Oh yeah, we've got widgets and QML. Yes, um, sorry. So we have the old technology widgets. Yeah. I see my edit this. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, th sorry th about that. That um, part kept going. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, it was okay, whatever you said after that. Uh, so we have this, yeah. And we have a new technology, Cute Quick, mm -hmm. um, which is being targeted towards that mobile audience at a lower level in the stack by Cute. Mm -hmm. So we have it written for Yola and for Android and targeting those things. Mm -hmm. And it does have that much more finer grain control over touch stuff. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the experience within KD applications is varied. Mm -hmm. There are some which are amazing because we have a Plasma mobile project. Mm -hmm. uh, so some are like touch first. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, we have been trying to push for that convergence so there's there's stuff that works on your desktop, works on phone, which is perfect. And because it's a huge project, we've got stuff that simply isn't targeting that. Right. So I don't think you can paint all of KD with a single single brush because in an application like KFloppy, an application for formatting your floppy disks, nobody's gone and said, let's update this for touch. I was going to say, when and... was the last time someone touched the code base for that? I think it's actually been deprecated, but okay. only like in the last year or so. So I've been still <laughs> okay. going to be my go-to example. Okay, um, sure. But yeah, I mean, uh, we've been releasing it, releasing it because it takes no effort mm -hmm. to just update to new, new, new libraries and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's very uh, plasma as a shell. Again, I mean, you've got a plasma mobile project that's really pushing it. Two in one support situation where it's halfway between the two. Mm. We have some support. Things could be better, like a virtual keyboard and how it interacts. Certainly on Wayland, the situation's better than on X. So, generally good, could be better. That's a, that's a takeaway. Right. So, it's fair to say desktop is sort of the focus and other things. It, you would like it to be better, but it's not like they're being just 
thrown to the side, not worried, not worried about whatsoever. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so... And your file manager is a bit quirky to get used to, but mm. if you take something like a Steam Deck where it's hybrid, mm. um, and you can use your fingers for doing a bit of operation, but there we didn't want to just make it a big touch UI because the desktop mode is there for if you want a full-fledged desktop, and right, you've got right. a touchpad anyway. So, yeah, so things are okay. Steam Deck's a really interesting device. The, like, the... Valve decided to do something very different from what they tried last time. When they tried the whole Debian, I think it was, what was it, Debian 9 or it was so, so, something old at this point. I don't remember exactly which version it was. And then I, I don't even remember what they had as a, did they even have a desktop or not? Was it everything? It did, it did have, it did have GNOME that you could access. Oh, it was GNOME, a, was it? A, it was GNOME. Ah. <laughs> And now they've they've got this like immutable arch thing with KDE. It seems like I, I've looked at some of the um the the Valve Linux documentation. It seems like whoever they have there clearly has a deep understanding of Linux. Like the documentation is clearly written by someone who actually knows what they're talking about when it comes to Linux. And there's like there's in in one one example I like for example. Is, uh, in their documentation on Linux VR support, it mentions like supported things. So it's like everything on X11, KD Plasma, W root, and then lists out like not just Sway, but I think it mentioned it mentions Hyperland and another like relatively like you know small-ish project. Like clearly, whoever wrote this is not just like. You know, I'm just going to mention the biggest thing. Like, they actually know some of the things that exist in this environment. Oh, definitely. I mean, there's talented people here and people who are in the community. There's names that you mm. know from your community just working in collaboration. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, it's... I'm, I'm really happy with the state that, like, gaming's in on Linux at this point. It's gotten... It's gotten a lot better, for sure. <laughs> for sure, in yeah. the past couple of years. Um, but were there any, like, does... With that whole, like, extra user base that came in from the Steam Deck being this, like, sort of, like, big install base for uh, KDE, was there anything, like, that was specifically changed because the Steam Deck showed some sort of holes in the design? Or, like, any... Any areas where things could be improved? If, if, it, if there's anything that comes to mind. With my upstream KD hat on, mm -hmm. uh, very little feedback has come from the Steam community. And if you look at your social media, you can mm -hmm. definitely see people saying, I'm using a desktop mode, I'm using a desktop right, mode, right, I'm right. using it and stuff. But there's been very few bug reports, mm -hmm. which could be a sense of not feeling like it's a community to get involved in right. because it's a product product you've bought rather than something you've gone and i mean you wouldn't install kde on art without having an understanding of open source and mm -hmm. all of this sort of kind of thing so there hasn't been a lot of engagement through our typical channels from steam deck users mm -hmm. and because of that there's been little feedback but if you look at your social media there is all this stuff mm -hmm. Um, I don't think anything's come in directly because of that. Mm -hmm. It is a nice positive sense within the KD community since it, because having somebody else believe in your project mm. helps. I mean, yeah. uh, there's a social side of that within I mean, the last few conferences has been a bit, bit more of a buzz than has been in the previous years. Mm -hmm. So... In future years, when we get Dell and IBM on board, and they'll be <laughs> shifting it by default. And uh... yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you have to get them to stop selling devices with uh, Ubuntu on it, then, and then maybe you'll uh, maybe you get something then. Yeah, yeah. Maybe well, get maybe get them I mean, on uh, on like Ubuntu or something. Then you get some uh, some KD discussion. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I I think you do make a good point about it being, like, a product. Because, like, it's it's a lot... How would, I, how would I say it? Like, when something is... 
what you've chosen to install yourself, there's going to be a lot more interest in make uh, in getting it to improve and you have a more of an understanding of what you're actually running in the first place like i can imagine there are a lot of steam deck users who this is the steam deck desktop it's not this is kde that's running on the steam deck yeah I and mean, none of the branding has been removed mm. but definitely it's that sense of i mean when you when you select it from the main game mode it says enter desktop mode. It mm. doesn't have that KD branding. Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you want users to have that gradual introduction to Linux in in a way where it is something that people just use. I mean, most of our audience of people are just using Linux rather than contributing back. Yeah. And that's the way it should be. I mean, you don't, you don't want your or your user base to be the same as your Git history. <laughs> it, it, Otherwise, you're not doing it for people. Mm-hmm. So, no, that that does make sense. It it's definitely important that people get involved in repos. Like I've maybe not 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 always necessarily contributing codes. That, that's a that's a part I see a lot of people get confused on. When I'm like, if this is a problem, actually, like do something about it. Like there are people out there who don't know how to write code, and that's totally fair. But if you have like this is something that I've certainly had to... I, I've gotten more used to as I've been using Linux longer. Like, if you have a problem, actually go and mention that it's a problem. Make an issue about it. But do it in a respectful way, please. <laughs> but <laughs> actually bring up the problem. Like, a recent one that I had is uh, with Caden Live, um, where there was a regression with, a, with the new version of MLT, which caused MKV files to duplicate the first audio track onto every other audio track, deleting all the other tracks. Um, and nobody caught this before it, it shipped in a version of KDE, in, uh, in um, Caden Live. So I noticed that, I was like, hmm, this literally is impossible to edit videos in. Uh, <laughs> so I went and reported the bug. Turns out someone had reported a bug in like a with another name. Um, but <laughs> that's a problem that you know, needed to be addressed, and it, clearly, someone missed it when it got shipped, like, that part of the testing didn't get done, and now that problem, I believe there's already a shipped version that's fixing it, like, that's, because there was a report made, that problem actually got dealt with, and I've noticed a lot of people tend to just sit around and complain about problems without actually mentioning it's a problem, like, I, I can probably bring up a thousand different Wayland examples, um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sure you've run into very I mean, similar things. I've noticed. Uh, sorry, I cut you off again. I've no. I scrolled <laughs> through some of the things you replied to on, on on Reddit, and I noticed there are people that like complain about something, and you're like, "Did you make an issue about it? Give more details about like you know." <laughs> Balance. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with going, this doesn't work for me, I'm not going to use it. That's yeah. absolutely fine. I mean, I do that with plenty of projects. I don't mm. contribute to everything I ever touch. There's sure, no sure. responsibility there. But I think if you're going to go and complain on social media about something it, you actively use, then mm-hmm. if you're going to go to the effort of doing that, you might as well go to the effort of, of, of doing something productive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Definitely. I get, like, I, I get why people don't do it. Like, it's easier to just sit there and complain about it. Like, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so... It's also frustrating as a developer point of view. Because mm. if you do see people complaining on social media, you don't want to just fix it. Because mm. then you're just encouraging more people to complain on, on social media. So mm. it's like, that's an awkward balance. Mm. But you don't want to ignore it because it's getting attention. And sure, sure. That's a difficult thing to, to play with because... I mean, as a developer, I do sometimes see something, get annoyed by it, and then think, well, I'm not going to fix that now. And it's a very childish attitude because there's hundreds of other people also affected by the same bug not being tools about it. Mm-hmm. So you shouldn't just punish those people just because one person's being a tool. <laughs> but 
difficult not to to sort of separate that. Mm. <laughs> you know that's the first but, I mean, time I've heard that mindset about it <laughs> you know I, I, like, I, I get it it, it, yeah. it, it, it it is admitting to being childish but I've yeah. seen it play out so many times yeah no I, I get it like you know we're all just like I think that's something people tend to forget I've brought this up a couple of times in other episodes but a lot of people tend to forget that the people that are maintaining these open source repos are just people. Like, you see that screen name there, you see that profile picture, and it's easy to forget that the person doing that work actually is a person and has their own goals, has their own intentions. This this, act, this played out really well with the um, the thing with Gnome dropping X11 in the future. Like, that thread is an absolute disaster minefield. Um, <laughs> or that, or the Wayland positioning uh, thread that I saw you comment on, the uh, uh, EXT placement, I think it's called now. Yep. Um, like, that's a minefield. Even though, like, they're all, like, contributors there, they're, like, a lot of those people there are, like, very active in this space, like, you could clearly see that a lot of people were getting emotional about it, were getting, like, very attached to their position and not really willing to have a discussion about it. It's like, I'm just going to yell about what my perspective is, and eventually if I yell enough, people are going to listen to me. Where that's just not going to happen. Like, especially some of the most, like, hot-headed people, they just needed to take some time away from that specific issue, come back to it later, and just remember the fact that you know, everybody here is just trying to, especially in that, the, the Wayland placement case, like, everybody here is just trying to make the Linux desktop better. It's just that there is a lot of different perspectives on how it can be made better, and they don't really align with each other. Wayland definitely had a problem of a lot of talking, not a lot of listening. Mm -hmm. And... A big technical problem in, in Wayland, where there's always tension, is is all about whether applications should be built around Wayland or Wayland needs to accommodate the existing requirements. Mm -hmm. And those two are at odds with each other. There needs to be balance. There needs to be compromise. But there's not a lot of understanding each other's perspectives mm -hmm. and achieving that. Mm -hmm. And part of this, it's like a social problem behind this, is the people who hang out in Hash Wayland or, or, on Matrix and the main people on the, on the GitLab project, they're all excited about Wayland. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they're in that mindset that everyone's excited about Wayland, everyone should be doing this porting to Wayland and doing it just for Wayland. And mm -hmm. if you're not in that space, if you're trying to, in my position, I'm trying to make this in cute, this multi-platform toolkit i can't have wayland specialities in a multi-platform toolkit mm -hmm. so i am very much between this fixed api which mm -hmm. is immutable from a cute api and this wayland protocols which is this fixed immutable api ish and then i'm in the middle trying to connect these two things up and it's an impossible job mm -hmm. and if it's not done right applications break and doing an impossible job right is a frustrating position to be in. I did see what you said. At the, let's see if I can find the thread. I don't know exactly what you said, but what is your perspective on that protocol? Actually, for anyone who didn't, uh, didn't see my video on it, the idea is that right now in, in Wayland, there is no way for applications to position themselves. So all positioning is up to the responsibility of the compositor. So if you have an application like GIMP in its multi-window mode and the compositor doesn't have any rules for how those windows can be placed, like, you might have a situation where instead of the windows being placed, you know, you have, like, your main GIMP, uh, what do you call it, um, canvas with all the toolbars on the side, it might decide, okay, let's just spawn them all on top of each other, which is obviously not intend, like, the intended behavior that you're supposed to be seeing yeah. so what this would be doing is giving that sort of placement ability that exists on windows that exists on mac OS, that exists on linux with x11 
to Wayland as well. But the Wayland devs sort of have very different opinions about how this should be done. Clients shouldn't be positioning themselves. All of these different perspectives on it. But what is your perspective at least? I know the you did say that it's not like a consistent thing among um, KD developers. Like it's not like everybody just agrees on this is what we're going to yeah. do. But what? yeah, what's yours? Sure. I mean, it's important. I don't want to speak on behalf of the other Quinn devs who do have different opinions. So yeah. particularly I'm in this position of this cute Wayland maintainer. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Wayland's lacked a lot of is thinking about transition. Mm -hmm. Because people sometimes say when apps port to Wayland, mm -hmm. apps don't do porting to Wayland, toolkits do porting to Wayland, applications get taken along for your ride. Mm -hmm. So kfloppy, that floppy disk uh, formatter, works on Wayland because why wouldn't it, right? It's, it's a new version of Qt, everything just works. But that means all the calls that it tries to do need to do something. And it's absolute positioning comes up in all these different places. So pop-ups, if you position, open like a file menu, you want it to appear, it's a new window, you want it to appear just beneath the file menu. Mm -hmm. And Wayland has a separate protocol for that where you give it your relative position. And we can fake that on a cute level. We pretend the window's in the top left corner as far as the application's code is concerned, and then when it places the menu, it tries to place it in an absolute position, and, when, when, and then we translate it. Mm -hmm. In theory, that works fine, mm -hmm. right? But then, as soon as you get near a screen edge, you want the menu to be on the other side. It, you want to know about, oh, I'm going to go off the screen, I should be somewhere else. And Wayland, brilliant on paper, has this protocol where you give it all of this semantic information. You say, if I hit a screen edge, here are my constraints, here's what I want you to do instead, slide the window or flip to the other side of this rectangle. And you give you don't give it a point, you give it a whole rectangle. And on paper, it is fantastic. It covers everything. And I remember reading it thinking, oh, this is brilliant. I can come up with all these hypothetical situations in my head where it fixes problems that were unfixable on X11. And the reality is a lot of problems, or real-world problems, mm -hmm. which are only hypothetically fixable. Because right. from that cute point of view, where I am, I can't just magic this information out of nowhere. I can't work out what the client wanted to do. I've only just got this one point that it concluded mm -hmm. and that's a huge challenge that's why our pop-ups are sometimes off there's a whole issue of clients don't know their own positions but do know your screens so mm -hmm. if you have a, your screens in a weird position so the top left corner isn't on a screen mm. all the applications were going oh my menu doesn't fit i'll move it but because that's not where your window actually was it just meant the menu just went flying off into the middle of nowhere when we tried to map between absolute and relative and whatnot. So it's great on paper, but it requires applications having to change. Mm -hmm. And that's an uphill battle. And you need to think about its transitions. I think a good comparison is Flatpak. Flatpak, you're introducing a new way of packaging mm -hmm. but if thought about about your transition you can just go to flat seal or you can just check some boxes and if you wanted to access all your home folder you press a button it accesses all your home folder and then that application can opt into these portals afterwards right whereas with wayland it's let's get things perfect from the get-go and that's the only thing they're trying to accomplish. They've only got this one path of, we're only going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And granted, all this stuff on Wayland is better mm -hmm. on paper, but it requires all of these changes to just magically happen, mm -hmm. which you can't just get out of nowhere. I hadn't thought of it like so in that, in that fashion. Yeah, having that... Yeah, no, it is trying to like just be this revolutionary change without that transitionary step, which is 
fine for the open source tooling especially, but when you start getting into like, you know, you you were part of the x Wheel and Video Bridge stuff, that was a problem that needed to be fixed. Um, just doing things in a perfect way where there's no like transitionary goals, like it ends up just, you know, break, you know, Wayland's got this bad reputation because for so long, basic things have just been broken because yeah there's just not been a way to do it yeah so it's an absolute position it comes yeah, yeah. up again and again in all these different places so you mentioned uh, with the pop-up windows <laughs> any window of a splash screen a splash screen you want it somewhere in the middle <laughs> and that might be a default placement but it might not mm. and on Windows on OS X on X11, you just set a flag and it's done. On Wayland, there is a proposed protocol, but, yeah. and it replaces instead of just setting a flag on existing Windows, it's a new window type. And okay. I made a patch in Qt, and instead of being one line like it was in all the other platforms, my patch was two thousand lines. <laughs> and then I was so embarrassed of having to submit this to. The cute devs who don't know Wayland that well. And then I have to explain to them why there's a 2000 line patch. <laughs> and then I just didn't bother because they because would ask, what does this do better? And then I wouldn't be able to have an answer because the idea is from a pure Wayland perspective, you don't have API calls that don't make sense. You shouldn't be able to put a pop up on, on, a, on, a, on a splash screen. Mm -hmm. But because Qt and every other toolkit abstracts that, from an application level point of API, you mm -hmm. still have all of these options. So instead of it failing at a protocol level, it fails in my Qt Wayland backend level. Okay. So it doesn't really solve much. But then I'm still left with my splash screens being wrong. I, yeah, I, but... I guess it makes sense you would have to, like... Because you don't want to, like, fully redesign Qt every time a new Wayland protocol comes in. So you have to, like, force the Wayland protocol to function around the things that already exist in Qt in a way that doesn't break existing APIs that developers are using. Absolutely. So that's what I have to do. That's what SDL maintainers have to do. GTK, to an extent, mm -hmm. though I think... It's fair to say they get, they're in a position where they get to be Linux first. Mm -hmm. Whereas Qt's an SDL, not necessarily Linux first. It's Linux adjacent. Mm -hmm. um, they you know, still support us, but it's not... It, I couldn't get any public API at Wayland only because mm -hmm. they right, quite rightly would say, well, what's it going to do on Windows? So right. um, any public API has to work. And that means both ways, so... And then you have products like Wine, like people writing Windows applications, definitely not thinking about Linux at all. And Wine's in that similar position that I'm in of, you have to bridge it. Yeah. And they don't even have the option of putting in some Wayland specific API for applications to opt into. The Windows calls just have to work to do something. We are just barely getting to the point where game devs are choosing to include the Linux binaries to make their anti-cheat work. Like, that's as far as we've gotten to supporting, like, Windows programs through Wine. Like, it's... Most things just work, so it's it's fine, but, like, there's a lot of things that don't. At, like, at all. Yeah. And probably never will. You know, unless your Wine becomes, like, a complete clone of Windows, which... Maybe look one day. One day we'll have it'll be good. Yeah, yeah, uh, the yeah. wine devs are doing great work. I I have nothing but respect for the wine devs. But they oh, have absolutely. I didn't mean it against. No, no. But yeah. like they have like a a infinitely high mountain to climb <laughs> that is only getting worse every I'm single update. It, so. Yeah. Sorry. But somehow are managing to climb it. Some yeah. I I don't. <laughs> there, there's a lot of intelligent people on that project doing a lot of great things. Oh, definitely. So, when did you start getting involved with the Wayland stuff? So, embarrassingly, I remember 
2008, I looked it up, it was a conference where the then Quinn maintainer mm-hmm. uh, said, next year we'll be all on Wayland. <laughs> and... <laughs> It was a desktop one. summit in, in, in Berlin. So, I mean, I, I didn't get involved then. That was very much, uh, it, it's become more and more. Uh, so when, when that maintainer sort of uh, left, there was a gap and I sort of. F- right, right. I'm in a lucky situation. I get paid to work on, on, on what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, if I'm working on something, it means it's considered a problem space. And. What happened with my audio again? What? <laughs> I lost you again. Why? <laughs> what is Discord doing today? Yeah, I can't hear you. What in the world is going on? Okay, I'll drop out again, I guess. Hello. Hello. What? Why is Discord so terrible? We're back, so keep going, whatever you're saying. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> rambling about them. Um, I will need a prompt. Um, we're talking about you getting involved in Wayland 2008. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So around 2005, uh, sorry, about, around five years ago, I started doing more and more Wayland, mm-hmm. and then it sort of snowballed. Um, mm-hmm. It started just filling off the void, and... Um, yeah, and it's still so much to do mm-hmm. in terms of getting things right. Like right now, color paint, which I don't think is a particularly big application. You can guess from the name what it is, even mm-hmm. if you're not familiar with it. Not all features of that work in Wayland right mm-hmm. now. There's that toolbar on the bottom with a color palette. Mm-hmm. If you click and you drag it, it explodes. Uh. And because it's one of those draggable windows. It's sort of that, um, and we fixed that in Qt. We've got uh, we've got a proposed uh, protocol which isn't approved. Um, we've just currently got support coming up in Quin six and mm-hmm. and in Qt six six already uh, with support for fixing that within Quin. But but that's not enough. I mean, you want to fix things universally for it right. to be considered fixed. So we're still waiting on other implementations of that. And every single thing is just, well, you, you can tell what's happened with Wayland. Instead of looking at the public API of SDL and Qt and saying, well, here are our requirements. It's very much right. starting with this minimal application and then going, we'll start here. And then add everything as a case by case, solving a specific problem that comes up. So you feel like it's you can see designed us. backwards. Yeah, in in my my opinion, uh, sure. it's certainly I don't want to say backwards because that's maybe inflammatory, but I, I it's guess... not designed with trans- transition in place. It's not yeah, designed yeah. without transition of moving existing clients. Yeah, yeah, and. That's, that's the crux of it. If it had been designed by, let's look at all the requirements of all the existing applications, start here, and split things out so we can move and change things later. Mm-hmm. Uh, but start with this minimal thing. And then things like injecting keys, that's been going around in circles for ages with, with oh, remote desktop needs to inject keys. Okay, we'll come up with something specific for remote desktop. Oh, accessibility needs to inject keys. Mm-hmm. Oh, come up with something specific for for accessibility. Yep. Oh, uh, input methods need to inject keys. Yep. Come up with something yep. specific for this. Yep. And we've ended up with multiple solutions to effectively the same problem. Mm-hmm. None truly as standard as a as universal as they should be. Because you've got the portals, you've got Libby I, and, yep. and they all sort of come together. But it's still in flux. Mm-hmm. And it's still uses case coming up with, you know, and now we're going to have test frameworks wanting to do the next thing and all these use cases which are similar but subtly different. Mm-hmm. And you, you're 98% of the way there with all the way and stuff, but each of that remaining part requires so much work mm-hmm. that a uh, huge project's in their own. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't trying to, like, just say Wayland was like a 
disaster and stuff. But what I was really trying to say no. with it was like, the idea is it wasn't designed around existing use cases. It was designed around this theoretical sort of improved desktop. Like, this is what we want to do, not how can we do something that improves upon what we have and that brings everything along with it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's fine. I mean, a bit depends on whether you expect x to exist around forever for all of these old old applications or whether they should bring, come along to Wayland and then start chopping things down afterwards. And I, I'm of the perspective that it's easy to get everyone to Wayland, do your splits you want to do, and then start chopping away mm-hmm. gradually at um, making things of, oh, now we want to introduce a pop-up way and now we want to introduce a splash screen now we want to do, do, that, do that afterwards. And session restore for that window positioning mm-hmm. I, mean, I don't think it should be controversial that you should have a system in place have people use that Int- introduce your new system like your introduce your session restore for your absolute window positioning mm-hmm. wait a couple of years for people to opt into it and then remove the fallback mm-hmm. rather than not have a fallback right. and expect people to use something that doesn't exist and then make those people do work on implementing it because mm-hmm. that doesn't work. And we do see a lot of the pe- pe- people making a Wayland decision. The compositor developers aren't going out into clients and then, okay, I'll help you make those Wayland changes. Mm-hmm. They focus on themselves. And, and there's only one person who has patches in GTK, SDL, and Wayland. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a GTK, SDL, and Qt. Mm-hmm. And that person's me, and that's kind of a. I looked it up. It's not 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 meant as a brag. It's meant as a. We're, everyone's a bit too inwardly facing. I think if you, what we should be in a position of, if someone implements a protocol for doing curses in a different way, mm-hmm. that they then should be helping going into those other projects and actually doing that work. Mm-hmm. And we're not seeing that. It's just that. Yeah, there is. A very small list of names that I can make. Like, the obvious mention is, like, Neil Gomper. Like, Neil does a lot of work in everywhere, pretty much. He's not big on the GNOME side, but, like, everything else, like... Neil is, like, incredible. I love Neil's work. Um, you got work, you got people like Dallas Strauss doing incredible work as well. But, like, this is a very, very short list of people. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's always a manpower is an issue with every project. Yeah, yeah. But... but. What... Uh, in, uh, <laughs> so, go on. I mean, Wayland really just needs a bit more cohesion and working together towards that common goal mm-hmm. of we all want Wayland, let's all make this happen rather than putting a task on other people. It requires mm-hmm. less doing the work everywhere to bring the applications up. I think the big Even issue... Even projects. Mm. I think the big issue you have with with Wayland, and this is just a, it's just a natural problem of not having like a like a BDFL or some sort of clear leadership. Is Wayland is very much designed by committee. Like most FOSS projects are like this, but most FOSS projects don't have as wide a scope as Wayland. Like I'm sure that there is a lot of bike shedding on random KD projects where people have different ideas and how to do things, but everyone's trying to do KDE. Like, this is a a very set... Like, you all agree on, like, fundamental things. Like, we're going to do this with Qt. We're going to use, like, the KDE APIs. You all agree on, like, basic things. The Wayland problem is that nobody agrees... The only thing people agree on is we're going to make Linux better, which is fine, but there's a lot of ways to do that. Absolutely. And... Having people push in different directions is fine mm-hmm. as long as everyone listens to where I'm trying to push and then finds compromise. Mm-hmm. And that's the part that's lacking. And, and you're right, there's different perspectives. People trying to push for a security model, mm-hmm. absolutely valid goal. People trying to push for compatibility, my goal is uh, people trying to push for Wayland everywhere don't like want to necessarily rely on these portals and deeper stuff that you known people are pushing for. And yeah, different sides. And 
yeah, it's, it's tension, and it will get there. Mm-hmm. I mean, things keep moving forward. So that's my positive spin. Oh, yeah, things have I gotten mean, a lot better over the past couple of years. Like, my, my favorite yeah. example is just, just like three years ago, OBS didn't work on Wayland. Like, you couldn't capture your desktop. Georgia Savarakis did great work getting Pipewire video capture to do it, like, work. And, like, before that, like, you just couldn't capture, like, it just would Maybe there was, like, a, a special tool for certain desktops, but there was nothing generic. I like George. He's one of the few Q, uh, GTK contributors who's ever submitted a cute patch. Wow. One, one, one of three people who have uh, GTK and cute patches. <laughs> I don't know why I've sort of memorised this list. Of yeah, I don't know either. why either. <laughs> Face in my brain, it could have been used for something else, but uh, but I'll, I'll use it to shout out to George for being awesome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but as like as you've been going through this this whole Katie and Wayland stuff, now there have been a couple of problems that you've been directly involved in solving. The most notable ones are probably the compositor robustness and the X Wayland video bridge. Um, I'm sure you've yeah. done other things, but those are the ones that directly come to mind that I've certainly uh, talked about. Nice having life's work summarised in a sentence. No, um, seriously, I had two, two highlights. Um, yeah, x and Video Bridge is, is a good one because it ties into that last topic about mm-hmm. transition. And mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm quite a big believer in this don't break user space rule. Mm-hmm. And only people did x Wayland. Excellent job. And it does a lot. But I mean, to go back to that flat pack analogy, if stuff not in a sandbox doesn't break just because the flat box uh, pack exists. Mm-hmm. And I think a similar situation here, we shouldn't have the stuff in X regress just because the Wayland right. stuff exists. And unfortunately, the more esoteric apps are ones that are harder to push to Wayland, so they are ones that need the, need the support. Mm-hmm. So X Wayland's still important, and it's come as a big part of the project. I mean, X Wayland Video Bridge is arguably a small part, but the most visual, so it's why it gets talked about. Yeah. Um, the thing we spent the most time on was making sure in X Wayland when you use fractional scaling. And uh, Wayland scaling you set to be scaling of 1.5. You don't want everything to appear blurry. X11 right. apps to appear blurry because X11 apps don't know about your Wayland, Wayland scaling mechanism. And your Wayland scaling mechanism is fine, but it requires the apps to do something. Right. It requires the apps to say, I know you've given me a size. I know what scale you want me to be. Therefore, I'll do translation. And report back saying I've opted into doing this translation. Like, that's a summary of how it works. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's absolutely fine. It's a good enough system. But you can't retroactively add that into X where apps don't know about that. So we've put a lot of work into having Quinn just take care of that for it. And saying to, to X, I'm not going to tell you a size of Wayland uh, logical size i'm going to tell you actual size and then i'm going to translate all of your inputs and code inputs and windows about so that it match what's really on the screen and that was a huge operation but it's working quite well now and particularly you mentioned games mm-hmm. um are going to be on x for a while and that's really important that you don't just either waste resources blowing them up and scaling them down mm-hmm. or um or, or just making them blurry because when I mean, you've bought a fancy graphic card and then you're upscaling your game you're playing, it'd be, be awful. So I could really do really a whole about. two hour video just on the um, the wine Wayland patches because there's like seven patch sets at this point. It is a long and arduous process that's a while away from happening, but it's making progress eventually. Oh, definitely. <laughs> But I mean, for, for now, uh, actually, yeah, yeah. part's important. I mean, we're using Discord right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm running application. Um, I don't want that looking blurry. I want the font to look yep. like proper font. So that's a scaling thing. Another thing we did was making sure shortcuts still work. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, yes, yes. Or use a Discord one. example, pressing a button, uh, push push a talk. Yep. Fine, you want that to work. Wayland's got a concept of not allowing key loggers, which reasonable, you know. Fair enough, I'm yeah. going to say it's not reasonable. Uh, but what we've introduced in Quinn is a setting that says if you press a combination or just control or shift on its own, you can send that to X. Mm-hmm. Your password isn't going to consist of control or F or, mm-hmm. or, or, or the volume up key. It's only going to consist of actual letters and numbers. Right. So anything else isn't security sensitive. So... Can, we can share that. If it unbreaks applications, and it's a setting up, unfortunately, off by default, mm-hmm. but um, I mean, that's maybe a discussion, but at least as, as a path, at least as a path yeah. to say, we're going to fix all your shortcuts and still do it in a safe way. Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. It's not just we've given up. We're not, we're not saying, oh, just have a, let everyone be keyloggers. It's you can actually solve the real problem that the users are facing without having to jump between these two extremes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my per- that is one of my personal pet issues because I use OBS a lot and I will switch between my scenes using hotkeys on my keyboard. And that's something that I can't do on Sway. I could do on Hyperlane because they actually have their own system. I can do on KDE because there's like, you know, a system now. But... That's a, that, that, like, if I don't have that, that's a massive regression. Like, there are, like, weird work... One of the workarounds I was going to do was have, like, web sockets to do it, because that would be <laughs> the only other reasonable way to make it happen. But having, like, I know the end goal is, like, the global shortcuts portal. Like, that is the, the intention, but you are, like, you've made this point a bunch of times. Having these transitionary steps until you get to the actual good goal is so important because the user doesn't really care about how it works. Like, there are there are these nerdy users who care about the technical stuff on the back end. But at the end of the day, like, I want my things to be working. And I don't really care how you get to working. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I think the KDE side, you've got things a bit harder than... If you use... Don't sway. Mm-hmm. Wait, it's got your word way in the title. Mm-hmm. You go out of your way to only find apps that work in Wayland. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's, that's what your user base is catering for. To not lose some of my existing user base, I have to make things work for people who already have this hatred of, of Wayland. Mm-hmm. And I think it's perfectly reasonable for me to say, as a desktop engineer, I control how your pixels get to a screen. I control how your input gets to the application. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's reasonable for me to say that media player you use from United because you like it shouldn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that shouldn't be my call to make. I think it's my job to make that work. Mm-hmm. So we've got your scaling. We've got your shortcuts. My favorite feature, mm-hmm. the old X11 system tray, right? the version yep. before, for your debug standard, a version where you put a window and you embedded it in another window. That still works on our Wayland implementation. Like, it's a version from the eighties, and it works. The way it works is horrible. <laughs> we don't talk about the way it works, <laughs> but it, it works. You can mm. you can run hex chat, um, which you know probably hasn't been used since whenever it was last written. I, I, it's my go-to example. <laughs> and, yeah, system tray appears. You can right-click on it. You can left-click on it. As far as it's concerned, it's got its own little X11 window embedded in another panel somewhere. That panel happens to be off-screen, but it doesn't know that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that is such a janky, <laughs> hacky method, but I love it. That's awesome. <laughs> Oh yeah, and then that communicates via Dbus over your newer protocol to uh, to, to, to system tray uh, by by just taking screenshots of it occasionally. That is disgusting. I hate that. But what's interestingly is I broke it. Um, right. In, that's not an interesting part. Yeah, uh, okay. I broke it for, for for some esoteric setups. I broke it when using multi monitor and with scaling. Right. <laughs> sure. You know. Okay. Yep. 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 Uh, fair, fair enough. I I I, I, I did that. And then we got bug reports. Mm. So. 
that's how you know something's being used. Uh, because if you break it and then you get a bug report, then it must be being used. Mm -hmm. And and obviously somebody else went and fixed it because it was Fushin Wen. More shout out. Um, uh, but yeah, he, and I think that's it's, it's important to not break other apps. Mm -hmm. And then that brings us to you know, X Whale and Video Bridge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which you wanted to discuss, which came out of an accident. We uh, uh, was using a uh, conference calling for work. Um, actually using. Discord to chat with somebody, and we I like sharing screen to go over some code. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've hit a problem where I can't share my code uh, to do with somebody. And we're actually working on put some PipeWire implementation, because mm -hmm. uh, we use PipeWire quite a lot for, you know, when you hover over task manager, you get a little previews. Ah, yeah. Yep. Um, yep. So ah, we're using PipeWire for that, because it really helps us test all of the remote desktop stuff it used for more edge cases so mm -hmm. using it as a uh, daily driver and we, we had some issue on some driver some contents were flipped or something i can't remember what, what we were doing but <laughs> weird esoteric stuff with streaming and the best thing you do is you have a test tool you have a window it shows your contents and all this stuff with pipewire doesn't actually involve wayland at all mm -hmm. it's pipewire so yeah. I just went out of my own to, okay, force a platform to X11, and I can show a, a content upside down. And I was like, well, actually, you can see not just my debug tool, but you can see the contents of that debug tool. You mm -hmm. can see my, I mean, uh, see what we're doing. It's like, that's actually quite a useful product. And we had all your code. It was written for a test. All I need to do is make it, make, make, make tidy it up, make it, make it full screen. And do some slightly questionable things of making it appear invisible so you don't <laughs> see a window twice. Which involves some creative code, which no window manager developer should ever look at, because they will shout at me. <laughs> but, I mean, it shows the importance of being able to do these crazy flexible things. I like that. And, yeah, so we, we packaged it up, and we were planning to release that as, as an application of, if you want to do a streaming, open it up. <laughs> And then I took it to um, people paying with me, and it was like, oh, we came up with this idea, didn't take us long, uh, and then it fixes this, this extra issue. And they were like, cool, and now you're going to make it automatic, right? No, no, that would be literally impossible. And they're like, oh, yeah, you'll make it automatic. I was left a call thinking, I've got no idea how I'm going to do that. I'll put in two days. And then write up a report saying it was impossible. <laughs> um, that was my plan. But, and, and started looking for options. And managed to make something that worked. Mm -hmm. There's X11 extensions to let you know when other events happen to other clients. Mm -hmm. And I could detect when somebody tried to redirect, when any client tried to call a redirect method for a window, and which window oh. idea it had. So it's a very lightweight filter. It's only intercepting this one event. And then I check, does that window match my window? If so, boom, pop up the portal. And I was quite surprised <laughs> that we found something. I mean, it was a third attempt. Um, and yeah, I'm quite happy with it as an end user product. I guess that's... And hopefully... I was going to say, I guess that's what happens when a protocol's been around for over 30 years. There's going to be, like, weird edge case uh, built in every... Like, just weird ideas that someone has at some point. Like, I'm just going to extend this on. And just happens to find something that does what you need. Absolutely. I mean, I, f I feel like I'm doing more X11 work since we started working on Wayland than I ever did <laughs> back, when, back when I was... Um actually working on X11, mm -hmm. ironically. So I, I never had to open X11 source code before. Now it's almost a regular occurrence to try and make sure all your text waves and stuff works <laughs> as well as it should. And eventually you actually got something that, like, did the job. Like, you can just share the thing you want to share, which is awesome. Uh, apparently it doesn't work too well under GNOME. Um, right, that's fair. 
Oh, yeah, and it was Bug and Sway, which was entirely my fault. Uh, fixed in version 0.2, out today. Oh, nice. I don't know when you're releasing this, so uh, I don't know how to run and actually do this. Mm, next Saturday, I believe. Okay, so I'll, I'll make a release before... Now I have to time. <laughs> <laughs> never promise anything. Never, just, <laughs> never, never mention any dates, never promise anything, and you'll be fine. You say, no, um, working on it, get it when you get it. <laughs> uh, it's, been, uh, it's, been, it's been fixed, I just need to make a release. And oh, right, fair enough. Fun paperwork of, of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So but yeah, it should, should open up to a few more desktops. Oh, well, so, that's good then. Ahead. Well, obviously, like, your you know, initial intention was to get it working, like, in Plasma, because, like, that's what you were using. Um, it wasn't the intention to, like, have it broken on other things, it's just, like, that... You know, there are additional requirements Absolutely. you need to do to get it yeah. working elsewhere. Because once again... And, and ultimately, at some point, this won't be needed. Sure, at some yeah. point, all of, your, all, of your, all of your cases will just be Wayland native. And I mean, I don't know what other applications exist. Discord is that common example that we keep going to because it's one that got a lot of users. Slack, I believe, has issues. <laughs> Zoom fixed their stuff. Okay. Which is crazy. I guess all of that like, yeah. remote work money, they actually went to good use and they fixed some stuff. But Discord and Slack are the basically the only two that I know of that matter, at least. Yeah, yeah. that, that matter part's a bit interesting. Because you, is it, it's going to be some random commercial Without internal that. tool. And I mean, I want to have that available, but it doesn't necessarily need to be part of the Plasma release or anything it can just exist somewhere on the internet internet so that one company with that one weird internal tool can go grab it and continue their wayland port like you you mentioned that and that makes me remember that um i think it's like five years from now i don't remember the exact year but red hat is planning to uh like deprecate x11 from rel so, when that happens, like, that's what we're going to hear about the commercial applications that just suddenly don't work. Yeah, and there's definitely a situation where right now people hit a first Wayland issue and then just switch. Yeah. And it's a silent number. You don't know how many people are doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know in metrics from KDE, mm -hmm. um, I know our Wayland numbers are going up and up steadily and we haven't even made it a default. And now it's hitting around 15% or so, which okay. is quite low. But given it's not a default, it's not that bad, um, except on Fedora. Um, but in other stats are different. Gaming on Linux.com shows Plasma Wayland usage going up and up and up and up. So, yeah, I... But overall, I think Wayland's still way beneath X11. Yeah, it, it depends on... I don't know, because my... I, I did a poll recently amongst my audience, and my audience is the oh, yeah. more techie audience, so it's like, I don't know how accurate that would be the more general... Um, the general people, but... Amongst my audience, Waylon was bigger, but it, it's, like, within, like, 10% of, like... So it... And then Gnome, it's, like, a lot bigger. Like, they're, like, much more on the Waylon side, but KDE... I guess because KDE yeah. is more of that, like hacker desktop like there's more of those people who are like going to have these like 30 year old x11 setups that they just for whatever reason don't want to change i think also that big passive group the people who don't follow blogs mm -hmm. there's no reason to a lot of people won't have heard of wayland a big group of target ones won't have heard of it won't care about it yeah and at that point the default's the only thing that matters. Yes, I think that's a big part of why it's bigger uh, with the the Wayland side. Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely, and I think it did it again. Why? Why does this guy keep doing this? Every twenty minutes, it decides that it doesn't want to let you speak. Okay, let's do that again. Hi, we're back. Hello. Hello. Yeah, clearly Discord wants to stay on X11. That's what we're It we're really does. I don't know what's issues. going on today. Um, 
I mentioned that defaults bigger. That's why Gnome Wayland is way bigger than the Xorg side. I don't know what you're saying after that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, the vast majority of our user base mm -hmm. don't care about X11 or Wayland. Yeah. They won't have even have heard of it. You need to follow developer blogs and or some sort of social media, Reddit or whatever. <laughs> I, there, you can't escape it. But a lot of the people are just getting on with their jobs. Just yeah. using it to browse the web or write their thesis or whatever um, for those finishing FHGs. And um, so they're not going to care. Default's the only thing that's going to matter. And I mean, we could flip our default. It just did it again. Why? Why did it do it again? Oh my God. I don't know if this is like, I, I've not been having any audio issues all day. Like this, it's just Discord right now that's causing issues. <sighs> okay. Hi. Hello. Okay. Go ahead. Continue talking. I mean, we can change the default <laughs> now. We can change the default next release, and. It would have been fine. We, I mean, if people with the common cases, all the common cases are fine. I mean, I've been using Wayland and Des Daily Driver for years. Probably be fine for the majority. But we would definitely have a vocal minority of people we upset in that yeah. process. And, and I, I want to find that balance of not upsetting too many people while still getting the majority getting a benefit to Wayland. Yeah. So yeah. I think gradual process makes sense. But it's going to be some cut off and some level of compromise where we do upset some people. But hopefully, it can be as small as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, what do you think of the whole? You probably heard that Neil wants to drop the whole X11 side from Fedora KDE. Do where yeah. do you sort of stand on on that yourself? Do you think the KDE is in a state where most people are fine on Wayland or? Do you think there are still like areas where you would like to polish up first? I, on a technical level, I think it would be fine. Mm -hmm. On a social level, I don't think I necessarily agree with this idea of... I mean, there are things which will regress. Mm -hmm. And motivating them by breaking their stuff is not a policy that I think is very sensible. I mean, in terms of carrot versus stick ways of motivating people, you need to make that carrot bigger and more accessible mm -hmm. rather than just introduce a bigger stick. Right. And I mean, making a stuff, taking away an option, uh, it will work. It's mm -hmm. definitely a way of encouraging people. But in terms of if that's the right way to go about things, I'm not. I'm not sold. Mm -hmm. And I think everything can be done transitionally. I mean, I know you've been on Wayland by default for a while. I don't know how many of their users then change. And I think having that stat right. would be certainly compelling. I mm -hmm. do like as many stats as possible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Plasma Six is going to be a big jump in terms of. Wayland support because we've had our toolkit frozen for so what so long and now it's going to get a jump of all the work we've been doing for the last three years. When so, did... and it's going to be better. Sorry, uh, no, go on. I, I was just going to ask when. Um, when did um, Plasma Five come out? Ten years ago, roughly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. It, it's, it's been. A long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure someone's going to look it up and go, oh, that's actually nine. I'm anyway. sure. Um, yeah, I, I should know these things, but I'm old. <laughs> um, yes. So is it the right approach? In terms of what you gain versus what you lose, I, it, you, cause you, you, when you take away X11 and the fallback option, you lose quite a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't see what the gain is other than bullying people into into um doing more work mm -hmm. so it's, it's that effort of what other games are because mm -hmm. it seems relatively small 
Mm, okay. So uh, I'm not I'm not sold on it, but I mean it's, it's not my project, so sure. I mean, sure. I'll t I I want to make Wayland as good as possible. So if they do that, things don't reflect badly on on, on us, and mm. we'll definitely make sure that happens. And I do trust Neil to have all the information before making whatever your call is. But having fallbacks is good, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And we should change the default and just keep increasing our motivation rather than keep increasing a increase a carrot rather than increase a stick. At this stage, is X11 still the default of the project? I mean, in terms of the default, it's what a logger manager has the first time round. Mm -hmm. X11 is the default, okay, but configurable by distros. So, yes, it's a default, mm -hmm. but I would expect every developer to be running Wayland, which also is a problem because then potentially we're introducing X11 regressions. Right. And the sooner we can drop some code, the better. Mm -hmm. it will be, it will be, I mean, Wayland stuff is held back from the fact that we've got some of this X11 stuff. No one's, no one's utilizing some Wayland features because I'm inviting two code paths. And that's not always feasible. Mm -hmm. Or having features that only work in one place, which nobody wants to do. So once we drop X, things will increase with more Wayland features, more reason to actually use Wayland. Mm -hmm. But whether now is the right time. Right. I think we need, we need, from my point of view, we need a few more releases with us being a default from my hat, because we haven't had that. And we'll see that soon. Well, there's still, like, a list of blockers that are, like... I, I don't know what the link for it was, but, like, there is a list of KDE blockers that still exist. Yeah. I mean, it's a wiki, so, I mean, take it with a grain of salt. Sure, People sure, are sure. adding stuff on there. But, um, yeah, session management's on there. And uh, crash handling is something you might want to bring mm -hmm. up. The color management thing's also, like, a big with. one. Like, that's... Right. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, then... and color management's got a couple of different steps, but basic sRGB um, stuff will be in Plasma 6. Mm -hmm. I've got no doubt about that. And then there's, I uh, think we'll just see yeah. where we are when we come to a feature freeze and then make a decision based on what information we have then. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a near future where X11 is gone, but you see a, a near future where it at least... Well, right now, you would say that it's sort of the development focus, like Wayland right now? Oh, oh un unquestionably, yeah. Mm -hmm. all, all of the developers I'd expect to be on Wayland. Mm -hmm. I mean, developers of other projects as well, yeah. not, not just the Quinn and Plasma people, but, you know, people maintaining Color Paint or KMI Money or all of this. I want to start to see more of those people start using Wayland. And... Mm -hmm. But you don't see... Uh, not, not, not just the developers, but also people who hang out on his social media. The people who watch his YouTubes with Wayland in the name. Mm -hmm. They're going, they're going to um, have switched over already. You say that, but my comments are like... There's so many excellent comments. <laughs> there are, every time I talk about Wayland, it's like tons of excellent comments. And th but this goes back to the whole... There, are the people who are most passionate are going to be the loudest, and the people yeah. who are on Xorg at this point are the most passionate people because, you know, it does deal with the use cases for most people. So anyone who's left over are those people who are like, okay, I have this network transparency set up. I have this like weird set. Like it's gonna be those people. It's not just like I I write code on the weekend like those aren't the people who are like desperately holding on at this point it's like, the oh, people who are, like back to... it's like the devilwin users like if you're using devilwin <laughs> like you are very strongly against system d yeah which goes back to a point about vocal minority and mm. i don't necessarily care about those people i do care about that vast silent majority who just want to get our work done mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But hearing from the silent majority is also challenging because of yeah. how silent they are. Mm -hmm. So you don't see a... So we're not going to see a... 
let's drop X11 merger quest from the KDU project anytime soon. <laughs> I would be surprised if Warm were to land. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody were to make Warm just having seen the other one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't expect anyone actually like respectable in the project to do it just yet. <laughs> It, not just yet, but pushing a default is definitely coming, and yeah, yeah. that I would expect. I, yeah, I mean, that's, it's time for that. It's gonna. We've got we've got this list of requirements you just brought up, um, and when that's all ticked, we, 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 we move. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I guess you did bring up the whole. Um... You you mentioned like the session restoring stuff, the robustness stuff. Like we can talk about that as well, because that I think is also really really cool. And that I had no idea was even like being worked on until I saw the blog you put out about it. Um, I guess uh -huh. just briefly explain like what what the issue was and yeah, how you were trying yeah. to go about it. I mean, so the issue we've seen is at X server. Hasn't been touched for decades. Super stable. Mm -hmm. Partly because of that. Mm -hmm. It's also got a lot of separation between that and the components that are being touched quite a lot and doing crazy things. The compositor. Uh, because the compositor is doing all sorts of flashy 3D effects. And it's doing all sorts of other jobs. It's doing a screen sharing. It's doing global shortcuts. The compositor is taking more and more jobs. And... You don't have that separation. You've got everything all together. And if it were to crash, mm -hmm. you lose everything. You lose all your stuff you've got going on. And it doesn't happen often, but it's enough. Uh, and it's just knowing that it can happen. Yep. And that's a sucky situation to be in. Uh, you don't want to just lose all your stuff. So we set out to try and fix that. And the solution's very simple. Mm -hmm. Instead of clients quitting when they detect that the compositor is gone, they don't. And obviously that part's easy. But you still need to um, c c come back and say, okay, I remember I, I, I was showing a window. Here's all the information for that window again. Mm -hmm. And if you're using a toolkit, which the vast, 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 vast majority of applications are doing, that's pretty trivial. You know, your toolkit knows about your current state that we were in. And it also knows how to cancel any operations that were happening if you were doing a drag and drop, if your mouse was held down, or if you had keyboard focus. So all we need to do is have your toolkit pretend a bunch of events have happened and then the applications come back. And I mean, I'm not going to do it right now, but I could run Quinn Wayland replace and applications come back. And most importantly, because transition is very important, I don't need to touch those applications. Yep. So I wrote support in Qt, and that doesn't have any external dependencies. That's going to be in Qt 6.6. .6. So any application using Qt 6, with maybe a few exceptions for some quirky whaling things, will just reconnect and restore. And even if you're using some KDE libraries, for other additional Wayland things, they've all got your restart handling. It'll just come back, same as before. Other than your windows jumping about, you don't really notice it. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about Qt. We also have patches for GTK and patches for SDL. Mm -hmm. The challenge with those is we also need patches in Mesa. Well, not just Mesa, obviously in Video Driver. Uh, some patches in the graphics stack because we need to tell them, here's a new pointer to a new connection. Right. And all they need to do is update one tiny number between here and this space. But sorting out that is, is challenging. Um, so we've got a proposed GL extension. I, I've, I've been putting it off because mostly about just dealing with all of the politics of it. Right, right. And my intention was... I had some pushback with people saying, oh, this isn't going to work. I managed to make it work and cute without any dependencies. So once we start seeing that, once people start seeing, well, it does, right? I've, I've tried it 20 times and it keeps coming back and I can't break it. Then when I submit these other merge requests, people are going to say, well, actually, it's, it's, 
it's fine. Let's do it. Let's let's opt into this. So that's what my plan is. I'm quite a slow person because um, I've been doing this for for years. Just every now and again, just pushing things forward, trying to get a cute side in. And yeah, once that's more established, I'll just upload these other patches. And SDL has already merged some of this stuff already behind an if death. <laughs> so SDL support's coming, and I had Counter Strike. Uh, CSGO? That's Counter-Strike, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I had I had, I had CSGO just surviving, just wow. crashing without <laughs> any issues. And, um, and I technically had to patch that game to use a newer SDL, right. but I didn't patch the game itself because I can't. And, you know, Super Tux Car, all these things, they, they just worked. And the patches are fairly minimal. Um I've got yes, got GTK patches. I was running Gnome Chess and all these other things. Something like Firefox might prove harder, mm-hmm. but Firefox also already has its own crash handling system. Yeah. So one of the design goals was to be flexible. Mm-hmm. If Firefox is is better off just quitting and reopening, well, let's do that then. Mm-hmm. And we just need a small hook to reopen it again um and maybe not have that prompt saying do you want to restore your session but that should be a relatively small patch and and, and then we're flexible with different approaches and i think that's important get something to talk it to handle everything if you want to do something on your own do something on your own mm-hmm. something like wl paste a command line tool to paste something from your clipboard if you're waiting on the crashes that exits who cares it doesn't matter in what matters is the file transfers and yes. all of the yes. more boring stuff. So it's not an insane concept. Windows does this under hood, but it's under hood. I am because Wayland's so low level, I'm having to sort of reintroduce re implement it in a few places. But it's gonna work. And it's gonna hopefully hopefully most users will never see it. But when you do need to see it um will be and then i think that's having that safety net is important mm-hmm. that but I, I, it's not uh, go, go sorry on. sorry yeah no no so I, I i've gone into just giving a presentation mode I, I no go ahead that's fine okay yeah but and it's not just about crashes i mean the developer experience mm-hmm. we're going twice as fast as we did before because i had my print statement like, uh, press the button, Quinn's come back. I don't have to reopen my ID. Why is Discord like this? Why does it keep doing this? It's done it again. <laughs> it does not want us to have this conversation. Go on, Tech, let me just see something. Yeah, I'm looking at my, my, my QPW graph. It says everything's still connected, so it's just, it is just Discord that decides it wants to cut out the audio. That's really weird. Um, I thought it may have been like pipe wire dying, but there's nothing wrong on pipe wires end from what I'm seeing. I don't know. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not going to fix it from here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, shall I continue? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, it's not. Not just about crashing, the developer experience has increased significantly. I could just mm-hmm. my, add my print statement, restart, and just continue where I was, mm-hmm. getting at information. And I think it's helping while we've seen uh, our Wayland productivity just jump in recent weeks. We're catching up so much faster than we did before. And that's good. Plus, it opens up some new other news that aren't just about crash handling. Mm-hmm. Um, I did some demos in my blog, which I know, I know, I know you saw, of switching between different compositors at one time and having that just work. Yeah. And so I have some extra caveats in here. Mm-hmm. In the version that's being shipped in Qt, there is some detection of making sure that you can't replace a compositor because that could be a security right, hole, right. sort of. Like we, we check your original sockets the same. Uh, so I just had to disable that code and disable that code in SDL to, to do this demo. So cheating slightly. 
uh, from the ship code. But it's definitely doable. And with some added infrastructure, you could sort all of this out. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. Maybe not just for globally, but if you could do this on a per application basis of saying, well, I've got this one application open, now send that down Waypipe and then bring it back or stick it on another compositor, which is purely uh, on, even on a different GPU on a different GPU or anything like that. That's got some added perks. Like, I don't know where you want to take it. I just know it unlocks it so we can take it in some mm. of these places. Just having and... something there that's being shipped that then people are like, if you give people the option to mess with something, they will find a use case for it. A use case that you have no idea why anyone would ever want to do, but it, they find it useful for some reason. Absolutely. I, I think, it, yeah, I, I'm not going to tell people how this can be used. I think other people are going to tell me, and mm. absolutely, it's going to be interesting. And another thing I demoed, and again, this is the stuff about robustness handling, that stuff that's shippable quality, it's being shipped. This other stuff's the more researchy, not you can't use it right now state. Right, right, right. Of a checkpoint, checkpoint, checkpoint restore in user space. Mm -hmm. Of having this application, suspending it to disk, and then moving out to another machine and then reopening it. Mm -hmm. All of this becomes possible. And I remember I was reading through your Creo docs and it kept seeing oh, X11, you can't do this. X11, or oh, you have to also nest an X11 server. Oh, horrible hacks where using VNC to try and achieve this stuff. And they kept saying, oh, it's not possible. It's not possible. And it was like, well, it should be possible now because I'm not. Because um, we don't actually need. If you can handle a compositor crashing, you can handle it being a new compositor when you, when you reopen. It's the same mm. thing. You just need to close the socket. So there is actually a patch in Creo, which I didn't mention. Is a, again, cheating, right? There's a patch in Creo that says if you find the socket Wayland Zero, instead of saying you can't handle it, just close the socket. It'll be fine. And um, it's this tiny, tiny patch of close the socket. It'll be fine. And um, and then everything just unlocked. Everything just worked. Mm -hmm. And it has all the same caveats that using checkpoint restore and user space has. Mm -hmm. Like if if you checkpoint color paint and then update color paint and then try and resume it, it will just say no. Which is fair enough. Uh, and it does detect it. It does just say... It's a very long message that effectively is no, but with a lot more words. And and there's also some issues of if a PID's already being used and other caveats. But I think when you combine this with flat packs, mm -hmm. some of those problems start to go away. Everything's in its own PID namespace. Everything's in its own mount namespace. You can control what version of something you know exactly what's in that bundle. Right? There's not a lot of stuff coming from the system. And you can pin a version. So, and you can prevent an update or warn something. So this isn't a solution in itself. It's, we've unlocked this. Somebody might want to combine it with these other things and make something new. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't. Maybe it's something that will only exist for a few niche cases. But I think unlocking it could be interesting. Mm. That I, I just think this is really cool. Like just just the fact that somebody <laughs> was thought this was a good idea and just like wants to see if it's possible. And everyone's like, no, it's not possible. Like, but you're like, no, no, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> like that's just awesome. <laughs> yeah. That kind of reminds me of um how uh I think it was DXVK came along, where the author was... Uh, no, it was the DX9 translation, I think. It was, one, it was one of the parts where Joshua Ashton was like, hmm, people are telling me that this is not possible. There is no way to translate these DX9 calls into something that works on Linux. No, I'm going to do it. I don't care what you say. I'm going to do yeah. it. <laughs> And then he did, and now we have DXVK, and like everything just works. 
Well, it, Absolutely. It, so, and this has still got to enter mainstream, and, and is yeah, this, yeah, is yeah, the difference yeah. between being something that we, we rely on for a few apps and some, something that works everywhere for every niche case. Mm -hmm. But, and it's handled everything I've thrown at it. So, it's going to be interesting to see, I think. Mm -hmm. Watch this space. Watch this space. <laughs> that something sounds sound like something a YouTuber would say. Uh, I'm, I'm, you, trying, I'm trying to take over this whole. It kind of sounds like it, yeah. Or someone who's trying to, like, pretend to be a YouTuber. <laughs> wow, that was an absolute burn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I presume at this point you are, like, just daily driving Wayland, like, just full stop, yeah? Totally, yeah, 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 yeah. What are you actually, like, uh, using I, as a I, distro at this point? Uh, I use Arch. Okay. Uh, it, it, I think the thing with being a distro is all, all of the stuff that I'm working on, all, all of the KD stuff, that's all self-compiled because it's a lot easier to yeah, yeah. just jump in a project if you've got that available. So to a large extent, it doesn't really matter. But I mean, for that reason, anything that's KD specific mm -hmm. actually ends up being in the way because then I've got all of their customizations. I don't want to distro those KDE packages. So right. I needed something that's as vanilla as possible. And nice and up to date, so that's mm -hmm. where Arch kind of fits in. Yeah, I guess that that makes we, look. It, it, you could have gone Gen two if you want to compile everything. <laughs> Just compile your kernel. <laughs> I don't as well, want to compile everything. <laughs> I mean, for, for all of this restart work, I've been trying to do some patches in Firefox and Electron, and mm -hmm. it takes a while. <laughs> it's like definitely uh, you start something going, and then you work on your laptop on something else for your day. <laughs> You're saying there's some uh, possibly some issues with doing like the restarts on Firefox. What would have been the problem? And like, I know obviously they have their own like recovery system, so it makes more sense to use that. But why would it have been an yeah. issue with Firefox to do it like in another uh, way? Uh, simplest problem means they use GTK three. <laughs> Changing GTK three is impossible. Right. Uh, it's, okay. I mean, it, you can you can get a bug fix into GTK three. You're not going to get a new feature. Mm -hmm. And and that, and that does put a bit of a problem in this restarting work. Is it's only going to be if you want to rely on it for all applications, it's going to be several years down the line before yeah. all your applications survive. Because I can't do anything for classic apps. I, I can do something for Xwayland, but that awkward gap in the middle of these Wayland clients are on Wayland and are old. So. I, no, I, just my, my file manager is PCMFM GTK2. <laughs> well, at least you're running out of next Wayland, so that'll be fine. Yeah, well, actually, I, I am actually on X11 right now. Um, I am very heavily you, considered. You have no idea how many comments you're going to get from that. Uh, you're, you're, no, people, you're people know that I'm using awesome you? right now. Um, I've, oh, okay. I was using Hyperland. I had some. So. I know that, that KDE does not have this issue. It, on KDE, you can capture, like, individual windows. On WL root, you can't. There's, like, an, there's an open bug report about it for a while. Like, you cannot do pipeline video capture for individual windows. Um, it's a known about problem. Uh, there's some issues that uh, Simon's been trying to deal with for a long, long time. Um, but Hyperland has a custom portal that lets you do the window capture. Um, I was using Hyperland, the custom portal, you know, whenever you're doing additional things on top of what's already there, you might have some buggy code, and there were some issues that were causing my entire compositor lockup at the time, so right now I'm back on X11, but I'll probably- Only you had a way to restart a compositor without losing your running apps. Imagine that. Well, I have- and It's not just about crashes, it's about your lockups, there's mm -hmm. just as- I, I have uh, said that I'm probably going to swap to Plasma 6 when that comes out. Um, it, it'll be my first desktop environment. I've, I've been using i3, BSPWM, Awesome, Hyperland, Sway. It'll be the first time I actually use like a full-on desktop environment. We have a reputation with point .0 releases, so I'm not going to throw it out there. But um, no, um, yeah, it'll be fine. I I know about well, I know about four. Four is obviously yeah. the most yeah. 
No, uh, six six point oh is not going to be the same state. Um, yeah. Is it? And yeah, definitely try it out. And um, and then I expect to. I'll, I'll be in the comments saying nice things. <laughs> Well, look, surely everything I've heard, it's it's not like a revolutionary, we're just trying to reinvent the wheel situation. It's like, we have a wheel, let's put some rubber on it. Let's make the wheel a little bit better. <laughs> I, if, if a thing with um, these big point, big releases, mm -hmm. it is not so much about adding stuff. Mm -hmm. It's more about removing some old... Old stuff because it's the only time to get to break API, right? And our uh, now it's problematic. Is it's the only time to remove some old stuff, and sometimes you do need to remove some old stuff to go forwards. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so if point O releases generally shouldn't be that exciting. It should just be the same, but you remove loads of stuff, and it's and it's kind of frustrating because from a user point of view, you expect point O big new number, more stuff, right? Um, so. We we end up having to sort of comply with that a little bit. We still throw in a few new features because you can't not have any new sure. feature development for a year while you're doing a boring. Double click the button. There's your new portion. feature. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, there's still going to be some exciting mm -hmm. visual stuff. As I said, I've not used I've not used it at all before, so everything's going to be exciting for me. Like, oh okay, just having well, a desktop environment yes. there is going to be crazy. Having all of these extra applications, having all of this stuff just pieced together and working. Well, you, don't, you don't need to install all the other applications. You just install a plasma that's, base. That's fair. And I mean, and it's going to give you all of the stuff, like being able to choose your network and your Bluetooth and your volumes. And I remember in the days of the old, just running at lightweight, I mean, when the manager, you have to do all of that, mm -hmm. you know, by hand. Um, so you're going to have all of that stuff. But applications bring in what you need that's fair there's no there's no uh, i think there is a meta package it'll bring in the entire world but i don't think everyone uses that particularly on the arch base if you well, want to pull in what you need to be fair i already have a bunch of kde dependencies installed because i have Caden live installed which pulls in a lot of things <laughs> Yeah, we 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 tried to split our packages up to be really tiny, mm -hmm. and the rationale behind that wasn't so much for Linux usage, mm -hmm. but it was about people making them better clients. Qt's got a huge world there, and mm -hmm. if one of those people needs to extract a zip archive or whatever, grab the relevant library. If mm -hmm. one of those needs to do some advanced translation, grab uh, grab our libraries and making it more accessible for those people to just mm -hmm. compile and stuff, right. and that meant our dependencies look bigger, mm -hmm. so it could have gone from instead of having KD libs, which is one library, we've now got fifty tiny libraries. Right. But it's actually it's actually smaller mm -hmm. because of that. You're only pulling in what you need, mm. but it looks like a bigger number. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that does make sense. Um, I've I've said this before, but I have currently nineteen hundred and three packages on this system. Um. 1903. So, I mean, frameworks, KDE libraries is, is, is roughly 100 if mm. you get all of them. Yeah. I can't imagine Caden Live is using all of them, but. No, I, I wouldn't be far off. It'll be using quite a bit. No, my problem is yeah. that I've had this system for probably like four or so years on my last reinstall. And I, you know, will. I, I will do these showcases of applications and then I sometimes forget to uninstall them. So I build up a lot of garbage over the years. <laughs> um, I've considered doing like a fresh install and then doing that testing inside of like DistroBox. Just having containers there so I can just delete the containers wherever I'm done with the application. Um, but that involves me just doing a reinstall and I really don't want to do that. I'm, I'm too lazy. Uh. It all works. If, so I I'm, I'm just don't want to touch it right now. I'll, I'll do a reinstall when my, uh, my root drive dies. Your Discord doesn't work. <sighs> Burn. Yeah, that's true. I don't know why. I, I don't know what's going on today with Discord. No, 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 no we didn't fix it. <laughs> I wish I, I look if if a reinstall would fix the Discord right now, I'll go do a reinstall. <laughs> but I, I yeah, that's that one. That one's definitely not going to help for that. 
Um, I don't know. I'm happy with like Arch. I it it does everything I need, but like yeah. Um, I it. I, I do have uh, a, another episode planned soon with uh, Nate Graham, so I'm sure he's going to tell me plenty of stuff about Ooh. why Plasma 6 is going to be great. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a better salesman, definitely. He so. said have the technical discussions with you and save the other stuff for him. Oh. <laughs> he was saying that you're going to be a lot better at the uh, the technical stuff than he would be. <laughs> I don't know. He, I, I've read his blog post. He might be selling himself short, but... I mean, Nate does an absolutely important job because, and same with your YouTube channel. I mean, uh, communicating what's happening mm -hmm. is as important as actually doing it. But it doesn't seem it when it comes to actually writing a blog post. Yeah. And because it's time you feel like I could spend that fixing a bug, I could fix it. And I know long term that writing a blog post might inspire somebody else to get involved and they'll act end up doing more work yeah. than if I just fixed a bug. But in that short term, it's still like, oh, no, I should just do something more, produc more productive. Mm -hmm. So Nate's role of summarising what we're all doing and then actually telling people, I think there's been this perception of Plasma just gaining momentum in recent years. And I don't think it has. I think it's just, change the perception because we've changed our communication mm -hmm. and it's so important and it, it, i mean he does a great job of that yeah it, it can seem like especially with some of these bigger repos like wayland protocol is a good example of this it's like this impenetrable wall of just discussion like it, it's hard for someone who's not involved in that fairly frequently to really understand what's going on i can imagine katie is exactly the same where it's you need someone that can summarize what the what the intentions are here, what's trying to be solved, what's actually being worked on. And that even if someone doesn't directly go and help out, it may encourage someone to, you know, want to donate to the project even, or they they might get involved in something else similar. They might want to, you know. Having, uh, this is, uh, I don't remember who said it to me, but they would like to see more communication between these, like, between, like, YouTubers, bloggers, and then the developers, sort of bridging the gaps so people have a better understanding of, uh, like, what's really going on in the FOSS world. It, it goes back to the thing I was saying earlier where the developers seem like these, like, faceless entities. It's just a name and a... a a profile picture it's unclear really what's going on and people mm. like me people like nate can sort of act as that way for people to have an understanding without obviously you know getting into the the source the line by line source code changes that are happening like that's important as well but it's also important just to know that things are happening and things are getting better absolutely and, and and doing it in a way where you're not doing it just for your clicks. I mean, there's got your new sites, um, which sometimes intentionally stir up drama just to get those uh, clickbait titles. But there's not a need for that. There's plenty of it's only a drama. <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't meant. Uh, uh, so, anyway, so so your blogs that come from no yeah. and the ones yeah. that come from 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 Nate and Katie. Um, Sure, they're opinionated, they're only focused on the one thing, but they're not trying to stir anything up. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, you don't need to, like, like cherry-pick anything with... Once again, go back to Wayland Protocols. You can just say what's happening in <laughs> Wayland Protocols. You don't need to make anything up about it. It's drama enough well, by itself. Yes. Uh, uh, absolutely, yes. And then with players, like, there's a lot of exciting things that are happening that, like, just talking about what's going on like that by itself is already interesting enough like yeah maybe not every single change is super exciting but like there is enough interesting stuff there that you know gets like there's plenty to talk about and i'm i have this giant list of topics that i want to talk about at some point and i never get a chance to talk about everything that i want to talk about like there's always things i have to cut from the list just because there's just 
I, I do six videos a week. There's only so many slots for what I want to talk about. So I, I have to focus on like the, like the things that I, I tend to focus on the things that really excite me. They may not be the things that excite everyone, but if I'm talking about something, I'm talking about it because this is something that like, I really want people to know about. I, I think that makes sense because I mean, from a developer point of view, you know when someone's working on something that interests them, mm -hmm. and that's important to, for people to work on something that interests them. And you videoing it about it, it's the same as hashing on it. It mm -hmm. needs to be interesting, otherwise, it's not gonna go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that yeah, you, you summed it up pretty well. Um, they I... use. <laughs> I think we talked about pretty much everything I want to talk about. Um, I think so, actually. Also, we're pretty much on the two-hour mark as well. I did want to yeah. mention the the um, whale and input method stuff, if you want to just briefly touch on that. Otherwise, we can stop off now. You did a blog post about, like, I don't know if there's really much to say about that outside of what was in the blog. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, it, the only news from that is the input method guy, somebody who does FCITX, mm. came and said, a lot of the way input method works fundamentally is broken. Um, so, so that was an added twist. Mm. No, I'm happy to wrap things up. You can always have me on again. Awesome. Um, yeah. I guess direct people to where you want to direct them to like your blog or anything else you want to send people to give out some links a single click setting uh <laughs> give them some links where they should go whether it's kde stuff or uh, your blog stuff. planetkde.org mm. <sighs> so universal uh <laughs> What one is what one's planetkd.org? Is that? Oh my goodness! How how do you find anything? Yeah, so planetkd.org is an aggregator of all of the KDE blogs. Ah. Oh. Which are, which if you're interested in KDE, it's the place to follow. Oh. If you're not, I mean, why why would you? It's, I no more has a planet. It used to be a thing back in the day, back when RSS was cool. I have people just send me links. <laughs> I, I, oh, right. If you want me to talk about something, I have a suggestions tab in my Discord, and it's always just got people being like, hey, talk about this thing, talk about this thing. Um, I didn't know this thing existed. That's cool. Um, Lots of planets. <laughs> but, I mean, if people are sending you links, then you don't need this. I think yeah. you've got your own, your own magic world. <laughs> it's not everything that I, I talk so, about, I can... but it's definitely a lot of it. <laughs> Uh, is that the only one well, you want to mention, or anything else? No, nah, it's only blog.davidemerson.co.uk. I don't update it very often, because the reasons I said. Absolute laziness. But that does mean all the posts on now are hopefully interesting. <laughs> well, and, and not too much spam content on there. You focus too much on uh, developing code. There's your uh, reason for not writing blogs. Oh, I'll make a note. <laughs> is that the only thing you want to mention i'll just leave that in the description down below and i'll yeah I think stuff. So. cool if oh, there's anything for me. you specifically if there's anything you forget about i'll just let me know and i will just chuck into the description as well um okay yeah. Awesome. Uh, cool. As for me, the main channel is Brody Robertson. I do Linux videos there six-ish days a week. I have the gaming channel Brody on Games. Right now I'm playing through Armored Core 6 and Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. Be sure to go check that out. Um, especially if you want to see me very angry, watch me play Armored Core 6. I get very heated playing that game. Um, and if you're listening to the audio version of this, you can find the video version on YouTube at Tech Over T. If you're watching the video version, you can find the audio version pretty much on any podcast platform. And there is an RSS feed. Search for Tech Over T and you will find it. I'll give you the final word. What do you want to say? Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And smash that bell button for notifications about bells.
Perfect. Nailed it. <laughs> One of a YouTuber. See you guys later.